Hello, um, thank you for joining us for this uh, plenary panel session of the Harassis Global Meeting. Uh, and many apologies for some technical issues, which meant that we have been rather later than intended in starting. I'm Chris Morris, Senior Correspondent for Data and Analysis at the BBC, and I'll be chairing this session. And our title is something I think a lot of people have been spending a great deal of time thinking about over the past year, after COVID, cooperation in the post-pandemic world. And I suppose the first thing to say, as we all know, is that we're not yet in the post-pandemic world. It is still sadly very much with us and will continue to have a huge impact on all our lives for some time to come. But that obviously doesn't mean we can't start planning. Uh, it doesn't mean we can't start looking at lessons learned from this sudden shock to the world and working out how to get economies back on track, how to ensure that vaccination really is a worldwide effort and thinking about how maybe we can do some things differently. And I think it's quite easy to get cynical about that. Uh, people can make great claims about how we're going to do things differently, only to see us fall back on the old ways of doing things, even when they're probably not always the best ways of doing things. On the other hand, we've never in our lifetimes lived through anything quite like COVID before. So if this doesn't give us pause for thought, you have to wonder what might. Secondly, I think we all know that big change is coming, whatever we do. There's the enormous challenge of decarbonizing our societies with real and rapid progress needed during the course of this decade. And surely some lessons have been learned from actions against COVID, which can be applicable to actions on climate. And there's also, of course, the revolution in artificial intelligence and robotics, which is going to transform the world of work and many other areas of our lives. So huge challenges for anyone involved in any aspect of governing our societies. And we were hoping, hoping I stress this uh, to, this afternoon, to have on our panel representatives from a national government, from a national legislative body, the US House of Representatives, and from the world's leading multilateral institution, the United Nations. Now, unfortunately, COVID has once again changed our plans. Unfortunately, the Minister of Defence in the government of North Macedonia, Radmila Shekarinska, had her second COVID vaccine just yesterday, and she is suffering some side effects, which is probably something others on this call can identify with. We were informed just a couple of hours ago that she wouldn't be able to join us today, so we wish her well. Uh, we're focusing instead on the other side of the Atlantic. I'm hoping we will be joined shortly by Brendan Boyle, the US congressman from the Democratic Party, representing Pennsylvania's second district in the US House of Representatives. But I do have with me, I'm glad to say, so it's not just going to be me talking, in New York, a little bit further up from Pennsylvania, up I-95, the Under Secretary General for Legal Affairs at the United Nations, Miguel de Serpa Suarez. Miguel, thanks very much for joining us. Um, we're going to have a slightly contracted amount, a constructed amount of time, given given the technical problems we've had. So, um, what I'm going to do is ask Miguel to make some opening remarks. If Congressman Boyle manages to join us, then uh, he too will make some remarks, uh, and then we'll have a discussion and hopefully get some questions from the floor. So, without further ado, Miguel, um, I'm hoping you can still hear me. Over to you for some opening thoughts on this very broad topic. Yeah, but. Too broad your topic, actually. <laughs> Too broad. Maybe. It, was, it was good when, uh, while you said in post COVID, I don't know what the post COVID world will look exactly, but then you open to artificial intelligence, and uh, that's, that's, that's a bit broader. Listen, um, for someone who works for an international organization, in fact, the UN as the mother of all international organizations, um, I think the, the, the scrutiny on our work has started during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the Secretary General is putting a lot of emphasis now on, on the post-COVID world, on the vaccination uh, uh, part of it, uh, and insisting in the idea that nobody's really safe until everyone is safe. Mm -hmm. And if, if we want to go back to whatever normal is possible now, uh, we have to ensure a minimum of equity in the distribution of vaccination. Uh, and we cannot allow the world to go into a division between haves and have-nots, uh, because that, that will delay the recovery of everything. So maximum priority for COVAX and any other cooperation platform that will allow for um, a, a broad and quick distribution of vaccines. That, that's the main thing. That's the main thing. 
on all the rest. Yes, you know, of course, that we are preparing uh, here in the United Nations following the declaration by member states on the 75th anniversary of the United Nations. We all, we're getting older. Um, uh, we are preparing a, a document, a policy document called Common Agenda, which will elaborate on all of these aspects, including, of course, climate change, as you referred, but also artificial intelligence, possible impacts in the social sphere and so on and so on. And um, your boss, the Secretary General, has been pretty frank in the, in the last, just in the last couple of weeks, that um, not enough donations have yet been made to the COVAX vaccination scheme. Let, let's start with the way we get out of the pandemic before we start looking, looking a little further ahead. Do you feel the UN has the power to persu- enough power to persuade the big, the rich countries to donate more? Because the number of vaccination vaccines donated to COVAX fall far short at the moment of where they should be. Mm-hmm. That's the only power we have, actually. That's the moral power of persuasion, uh, which uh, we have to keep insisting. I mean, making appeals, the SG has, ma- has been making several appeals, like the biggest global moral challenge. Uh, we, we have to use the biggest value we have in the United Nations which is we are the only truly universal platform. And this is the place where you can bring everybody to discuss, even those who are in persistent disagreement over important matters, uh, you know, and the Secretary General has that role of trying to rally the international community around, you know, common goals. And uh, I, I think, yes, I mean, that's the main power we have and we have to keep using it without asking ourselves if we can do it or not. We have to believe we can. Otherwise, that's, that, that's our mission. You know, there's nobody who works for the United Nations with a, a relative dose of optimism. You mentioned cynicism in the beginning. I think a, a, some dose of cynicism is healthy in terms of our analysis of the current situation. But... You have to allow some optimism, otherwise you wouldn't work for the United Nations. And I guess there's been a lot of introspection as well. I guess we, a, lot of, a lot of us have had a lot of time, spending yeah. a lot of time at home doing Zoom calls yeah. and calls like this, not in our normal routine. Uh, I understand that we're still, if you like, in the middle of the crisis. But if you, can you introspect a little bit about the role of the United Nations? Are there things it could have coordinated better uh, we all know it was an unexpected time of crisis. It emerged yeah. very quickly, but we knew that a, a pandemic was going to appear sooner or later. Do you think there was there was, was planning the UN could have done coordination either before a pandemic arrived or mm-hmm. once it began to be apparent how how terrible mm-hmm. COVID nineteen was going to become? Yeah, let, I mean that that question touches upon many different aspects. As an organization, I mean the UN is very big, as you know. I mean. I work in the Secretariat of the UN, and as an organization, I have to tell you, I'm surprised about how resilient the organization was during this process in the sense that we could keep working on our everyday life and adapt the rules, the the, the meeting rules, voting rules, procedural rules. So all all that day-to-day life was not interrupted, and so things went well. Now, if we could have done better, the pandemic warning was there for a long time at the national level. I mean, member states, uh, the, the the experts of member states, including in, in our host, host state here, the United States, were warning that this, this was possible. Um, you know that there is a post-forensic report on the work of WHO. I, I am not following... I've not been following the, those uh, those issues directly. I've, I work with my colleagues of WHO, of course. Uh, there was uh, the, the relative politicization of the wo- work of the WHO, notably by the U.S., but a- as you know, they withdraw and now they, they came back. So uh, they, they are inside the WHO um, in a process of reflection which I think it's very healthy, you know, this type of um, pandemics. This is in my life, which is not that young. It's a defining moment on my personal circumstances. I, I don't remember anything like this, you know. Yeah, no, I, I, 
I think we can all amazing, agree on you know, uh, so. We can all agree on that, can't we? But I mean, I, I, it's interesting you say the WHO is on a in a process of reflection. Obviously, yeah. it's been incredibly busy. It's very hard to reflect, isn't it, when you're that busy yeah. and you're just scrambling yeah. every day to stay still. But yeah. I yeah. guess it has been criticised, for example, in the way, especially in the United States, and it, it clearly yeah. didn't yeah. help when funding was withdrawn. That has changed again. But it's been criticised, for example, for the way it, it, it handled relations with China. Now, obviously, as a UN body, it is, the, it is responsible to all its member states. But do you think some of that criticism has been taken on board? Or, or, or do you think it's been unnecessarily and unwisely politicised by by outside people outside the United Nations? Uh, I, I uh, you I didn't hear for the entire question, but I think I can assume the sense. I can guess the, <laughs> the question. Listen, I, I mean, I, I it, it's not for me to say if it's duly or unduly politicised. It is. I deal with facts. Maybe because I'm a lawyer, you know, I live with hard facts. That's not the case anymore. I think. These kind of processes, uh, which are led by member states, we need to sit very calmly and very objectively and go through the processes and the protocols and, and make our objective assessment. Uh, did, did we do well? Was everything properly uh, respected? Uh, were, were there mishaps? Were there institutional failures? And then we deal to, to, with them maturely and responsibly. That's the process I'm interested in. I've done that, you know, um, in 2015, we had a very interesting project here. It was a, well, what we call our first health keeping uh, operation it was um, concerning Ebola in West Africa. And we had to very quickly put a, a, a platform of cooperation between different UN entities in an operation that we had never done before, you know, uh, Ebola, which is was complicated. But uh, after that, we have engaged in that process of lessons learned and, you know, what, what did, we did well, what we didn't do well. And, and it's the same happening here. Note that the politicization by, notably, the U.S., it, it was withdrawn. They are inside because, I mean, objectively, you want to be inside in the sitting room discussing this. You don't want to be outside because if you're outside, you lose access to information. And you lose your institutional voice. So I'm very happy that the U.S. came back to WHO and is now sitting around the table having these discussions. That's that's very important. And you, as, as you say, you're a lawyer. You're the Under Secretary General for Legal Affairs. More broadly, how do you think the international legal framework in which we all operate has been up to the task of, of dealing with COVID and with the need to vaccinate the whole world? The legal framework sufficient to deal with with something which we as again we have to stress no one was expecting but but here we are in the middle of it has the legal framework stood up to scrutiny i would say yes i would say yes and i i would i would say that the problem is not the legal uh, infrastructure the international legal infrastructure we do have the basis for that cooperation what is important is the political will of member states to cooperate within a platform that already exists. And I know uh, that there is some discussion, notably in Europe by European Union members, about a new treaty on, on pandemics. Uh, I, I have not seen any draft text, but, you know, international law and the international order is in, is in a flux. So maybe, yeah, there are improvements. Uh, that can be brought, but to tell the truth, in this situation, uh, there were not important gaps that that have prevented uh, meaningful cooperation. And we have COFA, COVAX as a platform for cooperation for, for vaccines, you know. So the main ingredient is the will of member states to truly cooperate and face a global challenge. And, and of course, um, here in the UK, we have the G7 summit um, later yeah. this week. Yeah. President Biden's first foreign trip coming here to Europe yeah. uh, and the first time the G7, the world's most powerful leaders, have met in person for two years. So that, that's an important moment. And presumably yeah. from the perspective of the United Nations, proper movement and on, on something like COVAX is absolutely essential because people yeah. have to realise, don't they, that a yeah. pandemic isn't over as long as it's, it's existing anywhere in the world. Yeah, yeah. I think the Secretary General is invited to the G7 yes. summit. 
And I have not been involved in the preparation of his notes for this trip, but I'm sure he's going to be very vocal about vaccines and uh, the need to to help uh, the global South having the sex, access to vaccinations and so on. I, I, I could guess easily that he's going to put a lot of emphasis on that and on his um, uh, climate change because he's, he has been very, very, very vocal about climate change. Also. But do you think one of the things we've learned from the pandemic is that when push comes to shove, perhaps naturally countries look after themselves first, politicians respond to the need of the people who put them in office, their own voters. But when it comes to something as fundamental as a vaccine to save lives, it does mean that the world very divided again. In, 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 and, and unfortunately, you know, along very clearly along lines of rich and poor and, and access to, to, to medical knowledge and, and to the money that can create the vaccination programs. But this situation is different, isn't it? Because, um, I mean, scientifically, look, look back, I think I'm probably one of the last generation to be vaccinated for um, smallpox. There's... Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so we have eradicated that, then we have almost eradicated polio. So scientifically, we can do these things, right? Um, we we maybe have the automatic national reflex of you know taking care of our own people and our own electors, and and good. That's that's an healthy reflex for a prime minister or head of state and so on. But the problem here is that the fact that even if we're doing well in our country, but the rest of the world is closed, it will affect our economy, our freedom of movement. So we never really can get into normal uh, before we solve this problem globally. Mm -hmm. Because even if we solve it in the West, so to say, for in the US, we are ahead of the curve in vaccinations. And I, 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 I'm sorry for the minister that she's having side effects. I already had my two doses and I, I, I feel very safe now. But, um, especially in New York, New York State, um, it's, it's going very well. It gives you a new freedom. So even if we have that here and the UK, which is also doing well in terms of vaccinations and then, European Union and so on. Yeah, but what about India and Brazil and and the business we do with them and the movement of people we do? So we really need to address this globally. And uh, and this is a, a, a big test because member states and states in general have to realize, and they do realize that for some challenges, the nation state is, is, is doesn't have enough tools to solve them alone, you know? Not, not, not even a big state. So we are doomed to cooperate. We, we don't. I guess we don't so. Have but, but, I, mean, I, I mean, as you say, you look at you look at countries in Africa where vaccination rates are extremely low, uh, but also, for example, uh, access to debt has, has become more difficult. Um, it's 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 become more difficult for them to run economies. It's become far more difficult. For example, to think of, of development issues when you're just struggling to survive the pandemic. I, I wonder if, and I know I'm not really asking, I guess, as a representative of the United Nations, your personal opinion. Is the rich world doing enough to help uh, the developing world get through this extraordinary situation? Uh, no, I don't think so. I don't think so. But this is my personal opinion. And of course, your question is extremely complex and touches a lot. So it's not it a does. question that asks for a yes or no, okay? But yeah. let's say it, it will be a predominantly yes or a predominantly no. So it's predominantly no, it's not doing enough. But uh, this would demand, you know, a one hour conversation. <laughs> yes, yeah, right. this is true. Uh, well, one of the things you mentioned that the Secretary General is, is very much involved with, and we know he's spoken about it very passionately, is climate change. Mm. And I, I just wonder what lessons do you think the UN can learn from dealing with the COVID crisis which can then be applied to, if it hadn't been for COVID, probably the issue which would have been dominating the last couple of years and, and will probably dominate most of the next decade, which is the need for, for climate action and dealing with the cr climate crisis, decarbonisation, climate finance again for the developing world. What, are, are there things that when you've gone into crisis mode that you think the, U, the UN can usefully transfer from dealing with COVID into dealing with, with climate? 
Yeah, yeah, I think for, first they, they, they are linked because I, I'm a bit afraid of the post-COVID world in the sense uh, it's probably inevitable to have some economic crisis and to push us back from our 2030 agenda goals, climate change goals, and so on and so on. Uh, but um, what is pandemic gave us is a little bit the notion of global common goods like the, the vaccine should be a global common good uh, at the same level as the climate change and the health of the ocean sorry today's uh, old ocean day i have to repeat it so <laughs> and we have programs going on and this is a, a topic that uh, it's very dear to my work so the notion that we we here to preserve something for the 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 common good of mankind it, it it's very important mm -hmm. You see, the debates around the vaccination as is, is a common public good is, is the same as climate as something which is a global global common or oceans or biodiversity or, or I mean, all the, the, the ecological agenda that mixes with the welfare of future generations. Yeah, we're, I mean, not it, it, we're not doing enough. We're not doing enough. It's interesting, isn't it? One of the things I think a lot of people, wherever they are in the world, have taken from the pandemic is that the, the realization i guess which does apply to climate that the world really can bite back quite hard if we don't respect it properly if we don't respect the planet properly you know yeah. there are there are forces that, that really are almost beyond our control i mean the, yeah. the, the scientific response the, the vaccination program the development of vaccines seems to me has been a, a sort of a marvel of human achievement and yet here is something which is which is very very difficult for us to control so i wonder whether it does mean that that just in general, the general public will have a bit more awareness that when people talk in quite abstract terms about a climate crisis, they'll realise that they actually the, the planet is quite volatile and quite precious, and that will help. The young generation, not the old one. Old people don't make revolutions and they don't change anything. So but I don't expect it's... much from the older, but I do expect more from the younger generations and youth. They're much more committed. They have a sense of urgency. Uh, I mean, they they have grown up in a tougher world than I did, for instance, as a Generation X. I mean, all these millennials, they already had two economic crises, one pandemic, one climate crisis. So they are probably a bit more cynical, uh, which can be healthy sometimes. So, yeah, I think the, the new generation will be more sensitized to to the importance of dealing with these issues globally than the older generation. But I guess the challenge is, isn't it? It's it's the older generation that has a mortgage, has a pension, has a car, is I told know. it needs to change its its gas boiler oh. into a hydrogen boiler, and doesn't know where the money's going to come from. I know, the, I know. You know the the, the te teenagers, I've got two teenagers that they get it, but they yeah. don't have like they don't have that financial responsibility in, yet, which yeah. weighs on their shoulders. Hopefully, yeah. they will in the future when they look after me. But you know, at the moment, it's not it's not there. So, but. I, you're right. We do have to pass on to the next generation. But I guess in, in one of our challenges is what our generation does pass on and can we leave the world in a better place for them? But there will be social tensions also, you know. I mean, even when we think in COVID, this notion of uh, intergenerational solidarity was also at play during COVID because the lockdowns were mostly done, I mean, in pure statistical terms, more to protect older populations. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, I mean, we have been asking a lot for, from our youth since in this century, you know, frankly, because, again, we to do two big crises, economic crisis, one climate crisis, one pandemic. Yeah, the social tensions will be there, but I hope they will be settled and solved on a peaceful, consensual manner. But I, th I see the potential of increasing social tensions between generations and, and regions and so on. Do you think do you think the UN emerges stronger from a crisis like this? I mean, obviously, people have turned to the World Health Organization. People will need to turn in, in many places where there are economic crises to other UN agencies. And I guess you have a, a you know, the most important bilateral relationship you have, I guess, is with the most powerful country in the world. And you now have an administration which is a lot friendlier to the United Nations, which is clearly a, a, a help for the UN as an organization as a whole. But does it emerge stronger from a crisis like this? 
I think for us, international organizations and for the United Nations in particular, it's a huge opportunity. Hmm? Uh, as the French would say, c'est pas gagné. Hmm? So we have to work for that. Uh, I'm worried about um, the life of the United Nations in the next five years uh, for uh, other conditions that we, we need to see how they will play. The first one is I think there will be some sort of an economic crisis after COVID, and, and this will be an immediate challenge to the financing of international organizations. I mean, we basically depend on the kindness of member states. The second um, is uh, you only have mentioned the states, which is a very important, very important state, and I'm delighted that we are um, working uh, with this administration, although I have to tell you that um, much of you, what you heard during the previous administration is for internal consumption, you know, so Good we point. never really stopped work with our American colleagues and interlocutors. Important that this is said. But other than the U.S., I'm also worried how the tensions between U.S. and China will affect the work of international organizations in the next five years, because those tensions exist are real and they're here and we cannot ignore them. And I, I'm a bit worried how these two factors will translate uh, during the next five years for the United Nations and international organizations in general. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean. I, I get the impression that the U.S. is trying very hard to separate the climate issue when it comes to relations with China from other issues like trade and human rights and so forth. But there's bound to be overlap, isn't there? If there's a very bad atmosphere in, in several key areas, it's hard to see that not sort of blowing over to, to have some effect on, on climate diplomacy and the, and the obvious need to have an in, international buy in to, to, to a program of decarbonisation. Yeah. yeah. So one of our tasks will be to work to eliminate those tensions and uh, to sit people around the table and, 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 and to, to orient our common action to these common goals. But uh, we do have some challenges for the f next five years. But, uh, but again, we will face them with the necessary dose of cynicism, but with optimism too. I was going to ask you, um, I was going to pick up on that point when you said cynicism sometimes can be good because it kind of keeps you grounded in reality. But mm -hmm. are you optimistic about the role of the UN going forward? I mean, it's, you know, here in the UK and, and in the US, in fact, the gov both yeah. governments like the phrase build back better mm -hmm. as though we're sort of, you know, we've the, eco the global economy has kind of stopped in, in, in some in some ways in a way that we could have never imagined two or three years ago. We have a chance to do things differently. Um, it's easy to say it, isn't it? It's much, much more difficult to actually do it and to actually do mm -hmm. things in a very different way in the future. Yeah, no, I, I do think, and then again, uh, we have something that nobody else has. Uh, we are truly universal. And, and this is, it's like, it looks too simplistic to say, it, but it's actually very important. We are the only place where you can bring 193 states, big, small, rich, poor, north, south, around common discussions and common goals. There's no other place where you can do this. So, and, you know, even if people say, oh, but this is like an echo chamber or a talking machine bid, you know, while they're talking, they're not shooting at each other, as uh, Albert Camus said, you know what I mean? So, uh, yeah, I'm optimistic. I think there is a role for the United Nations. It doesn't mean that we can keep doing business as before, but nobody can. I mean, even nation states, you know, I think we're constantly interrogating ourselves or, on, on improvement, on how should we do things. But this value, this feature of being the only universal platform in the world, that will not disappear. And that's our power. That's our strength. That, at least for me, that's the way I see it. And and yes, the cynicism is because it's, I said it's healthy as a method of analysis, you know, or skepticism, if you want. Maybe because I'm a lawyer, I like to deal with hard facts and uh, you know try to be precise and and so on. It's not a bad approach, 
Mm -hmm. But uh, as long as you don't become bitter, you still have to be optimism about the possibility of changing things. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. <laughs> uh, Miguel, we, we've come to the end of our time. And uh, unfortunately, we, we, we know we lost the, um, the Minister of Defence from North Macedonia before the session. Unfortunately, Congressman Boyle never made it through the technology. Uh, but f and, 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 and the session was somewhat truncated. So it was just you and me. But thank you very much for offering us your thoughts. I think anyone who cares about you know, the international system and, and, and the way countries cooperate knows that the UN has has a big role to play in that. It's not perfect, but it's, it's, it's important. It's there. So thank you very much. And thank you for all of those of you who joined us on this call. Apologies for the delay. Uh, we, I think we've all experienced over the last year or two, one or two hitches in technology. We're all learning it. But um, here's to uh, a more positive future. Miguel, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. And happy World Ocean Day. Don't happy forget. World Ocean Day. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you.